right retention strategies, uh, a hot topic indeed, I, actually. So I, I said this earlier, this is another webinar on this topic. There's a lot of webinars uh, in the last um, in the last year and also in the last uh, few months. Uh, what we wanted in this seminar is to um, uh, showcase some experiences and especially we wanted a different approach, not only to share practices, but also to allow people to discuss and to identify their needs in their institutions, uh, because um, we identified uh, the Unica network that this is um, a topic that is uh, really um, interesting for all of us, but most of the people don't know almost anything. Uh, so uh, let, next slide. Here you can see the, the results of a poll we did um, uh, from these 10 universities. Only three said that they had something regarding right retention. Uh, some universities said that they had no rights policy. And uh, some others said, well, no, not yet, but we are considering to do so. So we thought that um, this is actually a very good way to uh, start um, increasing awareness on the topic and maybe encouraging some universities or libraries to start thinking uh, strategically about that. So um, next slide. And now it's your turn. Uh, this was our poll and this is your poll. We want to have an overview of the situation uh, among the people that has joined the, um, the webinar. And so you will have uh, just uh, one minute to uh, submit your choices. Quite a few responses so far, but there's no people in the room. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. We give some time because maybe they have to connect to the Mentimeter, so. Sure. Some people is also replying in the chat, so we will. Yeah, take I can see that. Yeah. Easy to <laughs> okay. Thank you. So maybe we can go to the next question. Yes, please. Okay, this is just for informative purposes to know where who we are or what are our, our roles in our institutions. You don't need to be very much detailed. So mostly people from the libraries. Uh, this is actually something we expected. Great. Maybe we can go to the... Yeah, maybe we can go to the following. final slide. And that's uh, interesting for us because we, we realized that uh, so few universities already implemented this type of strategies. I think that's very interesting. Uh, the I'm not sure option because uh, actually maybe our universities have something regarding retro retention, but maybe we don't know. Um, so maybe this is uh, one reason to try to knock on the door of different uh, stakeholders to know if there's something um, uh, that is being prepared. So I encourage you to try to find out. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, let's uh, go to the to the next slide, uh, Laura. Thank you. So again, we go to the to the um, uh, webinar. Uh, now we will start with um, Dominic. Uh, Dominic is the head of the Library Research Support and Deputy Director at the uh, University Library at the University of Edinburgh. So, um, uh, Dominic, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. You. I'll just share my And screen. thank you, Dominic, especially for uh, organizing and promoting this uh, webinar at the Unica Network. Okay, thank you. Can, can, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see that? Yeah, great. Yeah, okay. You can see. 
Well, yes, well, also thank you very much from, from me, for to, very much to, to, to Unica for, for giving us the opportunity to, to host this webinar. We're very excited to, to be able to, to contra um, contribute to this area of work. Um, so I'm going to give you a very, very quick 10 minute overview of some of the background to the University of Edinburgh's adoption of a rights retention mm. policy. So first of all, I'd just like to, to sort of introduce my library and present to you our, our library's kind of vision statement. And that is that the library helps people to grow their knowledge and create new connections through open services, collections and environments, sparking ideas that change the world. And I, I'm presenting this because you'll see that open is, is actually in there. Um, we have been very involved in um, open access for publications for, for 20 years now. We were quite early adopters to have a, a, a university repository. And actually we're looking as a library at um, a much wider kind of um, picture of, of open research services at the moment, looking at things like open research data, citizen science, all, all sorts of things. So this is part of a, a bigger kind of picture. Um, I'm the head of the library's um, research support team and our team's mission is to enable the university's transition to open science. So everything that all of my teams do in the library ultimately underpin this idea of a, an idea of, of a kind of a concept of managed cultural change that transitions the university to, towards a position of, of open science. And I don't want to spend too much time talking about open access because I think and I hope that people on this call will kind of know what open access is but I think it's worth reminding people that there are different routes to achieving open access for publications you know you've got the gold route where you're paying fees to publishers we have the green route um, where we're, we're running repositories and we've had repositories for, for 20 years now we have the kind of hybrid model um, which was that has been kind of adopted quite a lot in in the UK but we're trying to kind of back away from now because it's so expensive. That said, we are, um, we are um, making use of trans, um, transformative agreements or TA, sort of publisher arrangements that, that look at tran transitioning individual journals across to open access models. And then we have the diamond model as well, which is kind of library led or very often uni university led or library led um, open access publishing with where there is, there is no fee at all and the, the, the finance is found elsewhere. And I think it's worth talking about this because we we operate kind of a, a mixed picture at the University of Edinburgh, and to some extent, we we support all of all of these. Although I say we're trying to back away from from hybrid, and rights retention is kind of a um, a means for us to to start to do that. So. Um, to give you some background, I wanted to talk about the, the, the policy environment in the UK because I think that, that sort of sets the picture as to, to where we are. We have had a publications policy at the university for nearly 15 years and it strongly encouraged open access for publications, but no one really paid any attention to it, if we're perfectly honest. Um, We've also had um, various funder policies, so in particular medical um, charity funders, the Wellcome Trust, Cancer Research UK. They're big funders of biomedical um, research in the UK and they've, since about 2008, had fairly firm open access policies requiring recipients of their funding to make publications open access. This was followed on by the UK, uh, so UK Research and Innovation, UKRI, which is the, the main kind of government funder for research in the UK. And of course, there's, there's EU policies uh, as well. These funder policies have been far more effective than a university policy in getting open access because there was some kind of, there was some kind of teeth with it effectively. Um, people who were in receipt of this funding knew they had to make their work open access. Um, the big one that changed things for us was the Research Excellence Framework Policy from 2016. Um, so we have in the UK kind of a, a, um, a, a, an exercise that takes place about every seven or eight years that looks at the quantity and, quantity of, uh, quantity and quality of research that's been undertaken in different universities. And for the last exercise, it was a requirement that journal articles and conference proceedings if they could be made open access in some way, had to be made open access. And if they if they weren't, then they weren't eligible for, for assessment. So that was a big driver for enabling green open access for us. That enabled us to start to fill our repositories because there was a policy that kind of meant something with an implication for, for authors. 
But the problem was we were not getting the immediacy and um, things would go into repositories, but they weren't necessarily being made open access. We were having to apply long embargoes um, that, that, that publishers wanted. So referring back to that, that sort of policy stack, um, you'll see that we have, it's basically, it's a very conflicting and difficult circumstance for, for authors in the UK. You know, there are different publisher policies, there are different funder policies, universities say different things. It's complicated and we needed to find a way to kind of simplify the message for people. Um, we were aware that Harvard University in the US had been using rights retention for certainly t more than 10 years now. Um, it's something we've been aware of for a, a long time and we talked about for a long time but not really had much, much action on. Um, there was some work that was kicked off back in, in, in the UK back in 2018 called the UK Scholarly Communications Licence and I really have to credit Chris Banks who's the Director of Library Services at, at Imperial College London as she was the one who really um, brought this work alive for us and, and, and kind of you know, brought it to the fore. At Edinburgh we were part of a consortium looking at this work to put in place a kind of a rights retention strategy for the UK and we had intended that a group of at least five large research intensive universities would all launch a policy at the same time but we then kind of came into the pandemic and it was difficult and the coordination really really wasn't there and universities had other priorities at the time that work um, undertook some underpinning legal advice and we were able to, 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 to benefit from that. So we really have the UK SCL initiative to, thanks, to thank for, for our rights retention policy. Here at the University of Edinburgh, um, we worked with one of the solicitors, one of the, the lawyers from um, our own in-house legal department, so a university lawyer. And we were lucky in that she really understood the problems associated with scholarly communications and journal publishing and she saw that this was a problem and she understood that rights retention was a simple legal way um, to make things easier for, uh, for authors and in particular to allow authors to comply with Plan S. So I forgot to say earlier on but UKRI is, is one of the funding organisations that signed up to the Plan S um, open access arrangements and, and we needed to, to put something in place to, to help us um, do this. Because we had support from our own in-house legal team we were able to take this proposal to our own university level senior leadership so with buy-in from the university librarian, my boss, um, we were able to, to, to bring this to university senior leadership, to the principal, to the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of Research and present this as a solution. Um, and, and we were very, very lucky in that we had support from them. They said, you know, the quote was, you know, you're pushing an open door with this. You know, we, we of course, are, go are going to support this. Um, we did undertake consultation with uh, various committees across the university in 2020 and 2021. And then we implemented from April 22, um, really just to be in line with, um, with the UK, um, UKRI adoption of the Plan S principles. As part of the work that we did, we sent notification to about 130 publishers um, by um, email and by recorded delivery uh, of a print letter. Um, those letters were signed by the Director of Legal Services at the University, so the University's so top level lawyer. Um, and, and that was how we kind of, that was how we, we launched things. So our policy um, in effect, um, it uses a method of requiring authors to deposit an author accepted manuscript within um, within our institutional repository at the point of publication um, but also giving them the right to add a CC by license to that version and prior notification is given to the, the publishers. Um, it applies to journal articles and conference proceedings authored by staff members. Students could opt into this as well but it's not a requirement for students. Um, there is an opt-out mechanism um, but we don't make much of that and we actually receive very few requests for, for opt-outs and there are a few other things that we put into the refreshed um, publications policy as well. Um, I'm kind of aware that I don't have much time so as this is a top level overview I'm happy to kind of start to, to, to wrap that up but we can come back for, for, for questions later. 
Um, in terms of the next steps, um, we've been running with this for um, for a couple of years now. Um, we monitor the the progress, and I've got some statistics which I can also share about that. Um, we've only received a handful of opt-out requests. We've had very, very few problems with publishers. In fact, there's only really been one publisher who's, who's really queried this, and we've responded through our lawyers, and it's kind of gone cold. Um, but basically, we found this to be, to be, to be very effective. And, and even if it doesn't make everything open access, it provides more rights to our authors and provides us a kind of a really useful backup um, you know, we're still making a lot with, with transitional deals and, and gold open access, um, but this gives us a kind of a, a broader a broader range. So overall, um, it's very much been a, a success for us. Um, we are looking at the possibility of extending the scope to include books as well, but I think that's it's still kind of early days, so there will be quite a lot of consultation that happens on that, but that, that's the next step for us, I think. So I will park that there and hand over to the next speaker. Thank you, Dominic, uh, right in time. Uh, so uh, the next one uh, will be Gavin Beatty. Uh, Gavin Beatty comes from the uh, King's College London, and then he's Associate Director, uh, specialized in research and impact. So uh, please uh, go ahead, Gavin. Okay, can everyone see my slides okay? Yeah, yeah. great, thank you. So. Well, thank you for that. And um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we've done at, at King's College London. So uh, just to give a little bit of context, uh, um, just really just to sort of say a little bit about, about King's itself. So just to say, I think I can summarize this, that we're, we're, we're quite a big institution. We're quite research intensive. We're across central and um, south london and we cover most subject areas so it's just to sort of say we do you know cover everything from the arts humanities very heavy in health sciences etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know i think all the particular issues around specific subject areas do do come to us and we have had a um within driven from my uh my director which is libraries and collections we have had a rights retention policy for just coming up to a year. So, um, and we um, started those discussions about two years ago. So we started talking to our research committee and to our vice president for research quite early on to really sort of get those key people on board and really understand. And it did involve getting a lot of advice. So I'm kind of repeating a little bit of what Dominic said, but just to really sort of emphasize, we did need to talk to our uh, human resources department because this had an impact on people's contracts, uh, our university secretary who is overall in charge of governance and legal counsel. And um, I was kind of interested to hear from Dominic that their legal advice was all in house. Our legal counsel basically said that, you know, I don't have this sort of background. We all need to get some external advice. So um, I would say that legal advice probably didn't tell us anything we didn't already know, but it at least gave us some reassurance. Um, and so we took an options paper, um, but with a very clear recommendation that this is what we do to our research committee. Um, and yeah, put together, and the link is there when the slides come to be shared, our new research publications policy. And it was live from, say, March 2023. So it's just about a year. Um, and we wrote to about our top 100 publishers. So again, quite similarly to Edinburgh, our letter was signed by the vice president for research. So a slightly different approach there. And um, you know, and we are continuing with um, with comms and engagement. And I think it's just worth saying that um, we borrowed quite heavily from some of our fellow institutions. So when I wrote that options paper, I used quite a lot of a paper that had come from a group of universities in the north of England. Um, the policy itself was used some of the wording from Edinburgh. Although again, we did have to be careful because the institutional context is different. And actually, Edinburgh in Scotland and you know London in England, there is actually a, a different legal framework as well. So we did need to be careful that we weren't um, causing ourselves some problems there. Um, 
so basically, our policy is actually slightly, where we're slightly different in Edinburgh, and I think this is worth bearing in mind because it depends what your own institutional IP policies say. And I think ours goes a little bit further than Edinburgh in terms of what rights the university claims and things like that. So we confirm in our policy that King's waives rights rather than you know gives rights away to enable publication <clears throat> and rather than requiring our researchers to grant us a license as an institution we assert that we have this license and it's it means ultimately the same thing but i think it's quite important to make sure that this is lined up with what everything else your institution says um, and um, you know, and the policy also is about researchers being aware of their responsibilities from their funders. So I think there are some quite clear things there that will be different on your institutional context. And I think for us, just to talk a little bit about what went well, um, <clears throat> getting our vice president or pro vice chancellor for research on board early was really, really helpful. Um, I did actually, as we were preparing the final papers, he did announce he was stepping down and I had a little bit of a, I won't say I panicked, but I did think I need to take this and get this passed before he steps down because I've put a lot of effort into getting him on board. So um, there is something about key people, but just make sure you know that they're not about to leave. Um, I think there was a big, started to be a big UK drive here, and I will have to credit Dominic and his colleagues at Edinburgh because they were really the first to go. And um, once Edinburgh put their policy in place, I think it really helped the rest of us to sort of start to think about what we were going to do. And when I went to the vice president, when I went to the research committee, the questions they always ask is what are other people doing? So to be able to say that um, the other members of, and particularly, it's the other members of the Russell Group, which is the grouping of research intensive universities in the UK. So being able to say, oh, you know, the Russell Group, we're all thinking about it. That made a really big difference. And it meant that um, this went through a lot more easily. Um, and I think as well, it's just to really put the focus on how this is going to help, um, and, but also being kind of clear about the risk. Um, as Dominic said, we have not had any pushback from any publishers. Uh, we've had a few who have been a bit iffy when we sent them the letter, but we haven't had any problems with people getting published, but we couldn't guarantee that. So I think we were just sort of being quite clear. <clears throat> and then really there's what we're doing next. So it's, um, we are now, and Dominic mentioned this as well, we are wondering about whether we extend this to books and book chapters. I was actually presenting at our research committee this morning on this very subject. So this is a bit of a rights retention day for me um, and publications and open access. Um, the main driver for this has been a requirement coming from the, from the main UK research funder who, um, and that's requiring books and book chapters to be open access in certain circumstances. Um, this is more challenging than it is for journal articles. There's a lot around legality and when contracts are signed and that whole policy stack. And there's also um, just issues around whether people actually want their, um, want their works openly available in quite the same way. Um, and green open access and putting things in repositories it's quite different, I think, again, I think maybe with book chapters, it might be a little easier, but for whole books, I don't know, the prestige is very important. Academics publish where they want to publish and anything that might put a strain on that is, is difficult and is going to be challenging. Um, I would say where we're at and the outcome of the meeting we had today is that we are going to include books and book chapters, but we're going to have to do it carefully and we're going to be spending a bit of time over the next couple of months, probably again, going back and talking to our legal counsel, talking to our head of IP, all of those people to really try and get this into place so that uh, we're clear about the wording, we're clear about how it's going to work. But we are going to do it as much as anything because we have some requirements from research funders. We don't want our researchers to no longer be able to get funding because they haven't complied. So um, it's going to give us a, it's sort of a, 
even if it's not ideal and not what people really, really want, it does give us a backstop and it does mean we can comply. Um, so, um, and that's something we are, we are considering. It's perhaps worth mentioning as well that there are a few, some UK universities have started to open, actually open access presses, even ones who didn't traditionally have a, uh, um, I know, a, a didn't traditionally have a press. So uh, UCL Press is probably the most, uh, probably the biggest in that sense, who've put a lot of investment into that. It's certainly something we're considering, but it's, it feels very much like something we either do properly or we don't do at all. Um, and doing it properly will be quite expensive. So um, yeah, that was really, I think my last slide. Um, I haven't been able to keep an eye on the chat, so I don't know if there are any questions or if we want to jump on to our next speaker and take questions at the end. Thank you, Gideon. We will jump to the next speaker and we will have uh, around 10 minutes at the end to, to try to answer some questions. So right. thank you very thank you. much for, for your presentation. Very, very clear. And now we move to the next speaker. He's Vitaly Levitev uh, from the Vilnius University Library. Um, he's Open Science Manager and he works at the Department of Scientific Communication and Technology, Scientific Information and Data Division. Uh, this is a different approach. Uh, so we hope that this is also very interesting for you all. Uh, Vitaly, uh, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, thank you. So first of all, dear organizers and dear participants, uh, thank you very much uh, for this event. And it's uh, a, a real pleasure to have an opportunity um, to present our journey to right retention uh, from the perspective of Vilnius University. Um, first of all, a little basic information on the university itself. We are not as big as King's College, but not a small university either. Uh, around uh, 20,000 students, uh, 5,000 employees. So probably around mid-size in, in, in Europe. Uh, and our journey, uh, it started in the broader context um, of, of the open science. Uh, we adapted um, Vilnius University of Open Science Policy Guidelines, and it was two years ago. The scope of this policy is quite a big one, but some of the articles were devoted, uh, directed to the open access, and um, it was pledged that the university will try to, um, to make all universities' scientific works and also final study projects uh, publicly accessible. And also, uh, we will give preference uh, to the pure open access journals. It took us around a year to create an open science policy implementation plan for almost six years, so five more years for, for, for this to happen in full. And in this policy, uh, two things are relevant to our uh, discussion today. Uh, first of all, uh, we want that uh, all scientific publications financed by national and European Council research, research councils and public grants from the university uh, should be uh, accessible through open access. And to make this uh, happen, we also, uh, as for now, are creating a funding procedure um, for the scientists to publish uh, their articles and books as for an open access. Uh, to analyze the current regulation we already have at Vilnius University, uh, two things I would like to mention. First of all, um, at Vilnius University, all the intellectual property rights to textbooks, other uh, scientific works, and so on, uh, what uh, all of this, if they are created by the university employees, uh, the intellectual property rights belong uh, to them. So this is an, 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 an important thing. And also we have a standard publication ag agreement. And in one article, one article is devoted to the uh, retention of rights. 
and free rights uh, that are uh, at the current time are retained by the authors. One is uh, to reproduce, uh, redistribute, uh, publicly perform uh, and display uh, the scientific article under this uh, publication agreement for non-commercial purposes. Also, the right to prepare derivative works from the article. And the last one is um, to authorize other to make any non-commercial use of the scientific article. As for now, uh, we are implementing uh, the right retention strategy further, and we want to do like fully to do two things. One thing we want to guarantee open access without embargo, utilizing a CC BY license and accessibility through a repository for all publications funded uh, by National and European Research Council, as well as public grants from universities. This is the first thing we want to do. And uh, to guarantee the flexibility to publish in a diverse range of journals, uh, we would like to establish a procedure to provide the means for these researchers to retain sufficient rights uh, for the reuse of their work according to their preferences. Uh, looking forward to the future, uh, three things are happening now. One is we are revising uh, our open access and scientific uh, and study works provisions, and uh, we, we, we will uh, implement a direct requirement here that all the uh, scientific works, uh, if they, are, they have public funding or funding from a university, uh, it should be of an open access. Then uh, now uh, we are at the level of a discussion how properly to create uh, the funding procedure for open access publishing of articles and books at Vilnius University. This is an open uh, question for us and I hope maybe the later discussions and the one breakout group uh, will help, uh, help us uh, to receive some new ideas for this process. And the last thing, uh, we are revising uh, the procedure of uploading uh, such uh, documents to our uh, inner repository. Uh, and this is our like more technical things uh, we would like to adopt in, in this year or the next year. So I think that's all from our side and let's leave some more time for the discussions and questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vitaly. Very clear uh, and precise presentation. And now, um, uh, Moika Kotar from uh, the University of Ljubljana. She's assistant to the Secretary General, and she will also provide us an overview of the situation at her university. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, so let me start to share. Uh, and uh, the full screen. Um, Raul, you're now seeing my full screen, right? Yeah, great. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so in Slovenia, um, this is a small country, uh, three public universities only, and uh, we are very much in favor of national solutions. Uh, uh, one simple reason is also that we don't have as many experts in the country to cater for each individual uh, university or um, public research institution. Uh, so um, now we have in place um, this uh, legal background, uh, which uh, prohibits uh, exclusive transfer of rights to third parties. That would mean uh, practically um, forbidding signing copyright transfer agreements. Um, this is quite heavy, and um, it's not really a practi being practiced um, in wider um, scope yet. So there is strong legal background for open science in Slovenia. Uh, strategic decisions until 2030. Um, there is uh, quite a lot of funding uh, to fund uh, infrastructure and uh, transformation of public research organizations according to the principles of open science. Open science is included in the uh, Research Act. And uh, what we want, what I want to show you here today is that we have this decree with a really long name. We call it Decree on Open Science shortly, uh, which has two articles uh, on um, uh, managing copyright. 
uh, the, the lines in blue here are his legal background at the University of Ljubljana, which really supports uh, open science very much. We are really lucky with the current rector now that we have. So um, in the decree, there is chapter four uh, about management of copyright in accordance with the principles of open science. Uh, this chapter has two articles, six and seven. Uh, Article 6 deals with copyrights uh, uh, over scientific publications and uh, Article 7 uh, with copyright in research data when there is copyright in research data. So that this is this is the provision now that copyright in scientific publications may only be transferred to third parties on a non-exclusive basis. Um, uh, we have heard from Vitali that um, uh, researchers at his university uh, own copyrights um, with uh, Slovenia. Uh, we are not really sure, <laughs> uh, according to the um, Act uh, on Copyright and Related Rights, uh, it's uh, the, the work for hire, but it's not being practiced uh, as such. So um, if anybody signs a copyright transfer, then whether authors or their employees, it should only be on an exclusive basis. And uh, in the second uh, paragraph, uh, this article um, requires that uh, copyright is managed uh, with open licenses and uh, it's the attribution license uh, or uh, share alike, attribution share alike license that are sort of prescribed or if there would be any other system of licenses, licenses equivalents uh, to these uh, two licenses. Um, this uh, this third paragraph uh, of Article 6 uh, may um, be seen as something weird. Why is this in legislation? Uh, but it, it has been done on purpose. Um, so if it's only in legislation, um, it's a bit distant uh, from uh, researchers um, that uh, have received uh, co-funding, public co-funding for research, and also much, much uh, far away from publishers. So um, the provision here is that uh, funders should include uh, these requirements on non-exclusive transfer of rights uh, and uh, creative commons licenses uh, or equivalents uh, into course and contracts simply because this is now direct obligation of uh, to researchers or um, universities and institutes to do this. Uh, there are some concessions uh, on longer texts, um, so um, they can manage copyright with uh, non-commercial license or non-derivatives. Um, metadata uh, should be public, uh, and um, so if uh, the, the, the license should be CC0 or CC BY, uh, in Slovenia, we cannot use a CC0 license. It's not possible to waive a copyright, so it would be CC BY. Uh, so this is Article 6 uh, and Article 7. It's uh, really very similar, basically the same. It's about uh, copyright in research data and other research results. Um, and um, the we here we have to suppose that if there is copyright in research data, then uh, it, can, um, it can only be transferred to third parties on a non-exclusive basis. Again, the licenses are the same, uh, CC by attribution and uh, attribution share alike. Again, funders need to in include this provision in course and contracts and metadata need to be public, um, public managed with, uh, copyright managed with, uh, if there is copyright managed with uh, CC0, public domain or attribution license. So, uh, in short, um, I just wanted to show you another type of rights retention. Um, I think that this is quite uh, um, a big um, achievement to have this legislation, but as I said, it is not being practiced uh, widely at the moment by researchers. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, Moika. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dominique, uh, Gavin, Vitali, and Moika. And thank you also for this uh, incredible time management uh, because we have enough time to some questions and answers. So uh, now uh, anybody can ask anything. Uh, so please, uh, you can uh, use the chat to ask anything you want.
I don't know if there's already anything on the chat. Uh, Okay, not yet. Um, um, okay, well, um, while some other people are typing any questions, let me ask something to all of you. Um, we are uh, discussing this topic from a general point of view, but of course, uh, different scientific fields, uh, different researchers uh, may find some difficulties and especially researchers in law or in humanities may have um, to struggle with the publishers. So um, can you uh, provide, I don't know, Gavin, Dominic, uh, Vitali or, or Moika, do you have any experience that you can share about that, about these uh, additional conflicts that these uh, humanities or law fields can, can present? Yeah, I can I can probably start with that. So um, this this was something we were we were concerned about, and um, overall, so the the university very very much like um, King's College London, the University of Edinburgh is a broad based university. We we do everything from fashion to physics. We do the the whole lot, and um, we're divided into three colleges, which are medicine and veterinary medicine, science and engineering, and arts, humanity, and social sciences. And we do by far get more kind of inquiries from uncertain authors from arts, humanities and, and social sciences. Um, but nothing has been been insurmountable that, the, you know, that not we, we haven't we have not found um, any cases of a publisher refusing to, to publish anything. And we have not found any cases with um, authors being presented with a, a a license that they they can't sign or, or 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 you know really don't want to sign that's not been able to 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 be resolved um again because we wrote to so many publishers with with quite clear guidance before we introduced this we did get we've had we've had, we did get some inquiries from publishers sort of asking what this means in practice and how it will work and most of those inquiries had kind of sort of what I would call sensible questions in. They were sort of logical questions that they wanted to ask, things that were, were uncertain. And those are very easy to deal with. We did deal with one publisher that was, was kind of obstinate. But what we did was that we, 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 we tried to bring together all of the questions we'd been asked. And then we developed an FAQ to, so to just to kind of to, to, to mitigate the, the number of inbound inquiries. OK, thank you. Um... Givin or Vitali or Moika? Uh, I think Dom, what Dominic said has been quite similar for us, really. I'm not sure I'd add much to that, really. Um, I think it's been less of an issue than we worried it might be. But the big issues, I think, are coming up um, around books, uh, yeah. monographs for, for some of those subject areas. And we haven't quite worked that all out yet. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's uh, actually a new horizon to reach. And uh, Vitalian and Moika, uh, what about uh, the relationships with your uh, national publishers? Um, how they react to these strategies? Vitali, if I may <laughs> take uh, the floor, the screen. Um, in Slovenia, it's quite good. Um, one of rare countries, I guess, uh, where research, national research funder funds also uh, publishing of uh, scientific journals, national scientific journals. And uh, if they want to get money to keep the money, they need to publish in open access, Creative Commons licenses. So this is uh, fully in line. Um, I think that the biggest fear of researchers uh, uh, regarding rights retention or achieving this is um, something that Johan is uh, telling frequently that they fear that publisher will not publish their article. It's um, basically irregardless of scientific topic. And this is uh, sometimes the reason that they're reluctant to, uh, to, um, to, to do what is actually in legislation in Slovenia. <laughs> so they just sign copyright transfer, transfer agreement instead of doing uh, what would be correct. Thank you. The very similar uh, situation is in Lithuania. And uh, I can say that talking about uh, humanities and social science, 
uh, compared to other sites uh, in Lithuania in the context of today's topic, uh, I do not see a, a, a big difference here. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one question on, on the chat. Um, um, Matei Uchitil from the Charles University. Um, is it possible to use right retention strategy by authors, even if the institution has not adopted uh, policies yet? Um, what leverage does the author have against the publishers to have long embargoes for publishing uh, author accepted manuscripts and, and assuming that researchers want to publish in prestigious journals? Uh, Johan has already um, uh, answered uh, that anyone can use these strategies, uh, uh, actually. And um, Dominic, Gavin, Moika, Vitali, um, any comment on that? Um, I was just going to say that what what's helpful about having the institutional policy is it's not up to individual researchers to have to negotiate with journals. And it gives um, the sort of legal backing of the institution. So while absolutely people can use rights retention statements and uh, they absolutely should i think institutions putting things in place is really important to protect researchers yeah that's really important indeed uh, thank you and thank you dominic for sharing the spark author addendum i think that's a very good example of what um, researchers can can use in their one-to-one uh, -one negotiation and uh, Anna Horika uh, from Charles University as well. Um, she's asking, uh, I would like to ask about hybrid open access journals. We have not implemented a rush retention strategy at our university at any level, uh, but from time to time, researchers ask if it's possible to submit their article to a hybrid journal with a CC BY licenses already attached to it. And she says that I think their main goal is basically to avoid paying APC charge. Um, so what's your experience, um, again, the speakers, uh, to avoid paying uh, IBC churches and uh, accepting articles in hybrid journals in such situations? What do you think? Raul, this, I think that Johan is most most knowledgeable to answer this, but these are two different things. Um, rights retention, uh, as presented here by universities, is over uh, author-accepted manuscripts. Uh, and uh, what... Uh, the lady is asking it's uh, that you would not you would do something to to um, omit or not to pay apc over the uh, version of record uh, the publisher's version of article this is probably not possible <laughs> to expect this would be really uh, weird to happen so i can probably come in uh, as well with that so um i mean we our funders are kind of signed up to Plan S, and that means that we're backing up. That means that we're backing away from hybrid journals. Effectively, we we are we do have transitional uh, agreements, which is it's you know slightly slightly different. So we we do still put a lot through transitional deal uh, agreements. But one of the reasons that we wanted to to implement institutional rights retention was to give our authors. A legal way of complying with the Plan S policies, which are effectively to to not um, encourage hybrid hybrid journals. So that that was a, it's kind of part of our part of our strategy with that. Thank you, Dominic. Um, any other comment uh, on that? No. Any other question? Okay, thank you, Johan, for uh, commenting uh, all these questions. Uh, well, I have a question again uh, about um, the negotiations, because of course, any researcher can negotiate individually, but we have seen from their examples in, in the King's College London and um, in the University of Edinburgh, uh, this approach, this more global approach from the institutions uh, contacting the publishers um, so this, I think this is great because this um, avoids uh, researchers um, uh, the, 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 the enormous amount of time to deal with uh, publishers individually. But uh, on the other side, um, maybe this um, enables publishers to adopt um, their own strategies as well because they will be approached by the universities. So um, what's your experience, uh, Gavin and Dominic, about this um, uh, institutional negotiation rather than individual negotiation? Uh, shall I go for it? I think 
Well, I think there are a couple of things I'd say here. In terms of rights retention, we didn't negotiate with publishers. We just told them. You know, we that in the letters we sent to each of them, it was a notification saying this is our policy, and we do not expect you to, um, you know, ask our research to sign anything that would go against the institutional policy. And certainly, that was the legal advice that, with that in place, even if they signed, say, a copyright transfer agreement, we were still perfectly, you know, we were covered effectively to still make that available through our repository. I think the other thing. I would say is that when we're doing a lot of negotiations for for deals with publishers, and you know, Dominic mentioned a lot of the read and publish deals that we tend to be a bit too reliant on in the UK. <laughs> it's I think having these in place does actually make me feel a lot better because it feels like we've got something else in place that can support those negotiations. It makes it feel like we could walk away because we have things like interlibrary loans and post cancellation access to back up the read. And now we've got rights retention to back up the publish so we can still operate with those journals in some ways. So it gives us a much stronger negotiating position. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I like that approach, uh, telling but not negotiating. <laughs> thank you. And uh, Dominique, anything to add? I, th I think Gavin's uh, pretty much s summed it up. I, I could just add that um, one one of the things that we were informed by by our legal services is that actually, I mean, we've we've not tested this, and we're not we're not really planning to. But um, if if we notify a publisher about this change and give them legal notification, which is what we did with the hundred and thirty publishers we um, we wrote to, if they then try to present an author with a, a contract that goes against that that is in itself actually technically a crime it's called procur procuring a breach of contract um and and actually they, they they really shouldn't be they really really shouldn't be doing that we've, we've never we've never tested that um but i think it's just having that assurance that there is that, that, that this is sound in law and, and that we can do this. And that was the basis for, as Gavin exactly said, it wasn't a negotiation, it was a notification. There was no negotiation, but we do, we will take it into account when we negotiate because ultimately we would, you know, I think we're supportive of transitional arrangements if they actually work and if they're good value, but if they're not, then this gives us a tool to start backing away from those. Okay, thank you. And uh, Vitaly and Mika, any comment on, on that? Um, I would only say that uh, whatever is done in a way that researchers don't have to do, don't have to contact, to persuade, whatever, it's really, really very good. Uh, researchers are very busy people. Uh, they, uh, they, they write proposals, whatever, teach and so on. And uh, this is something that if it, it can be done without their uh, involvement, it's really practical. Uh, now there is a lot of talk also about secondary publishing rights, uh, which is also something if it is done uh, at the level of legislation in a country, it's also very useful for researchers. Uh, as um, was said before, okay, we have these transitional agreements, but there will always be uh, one part of published articles that uh, there are there, there there will be no agreement, and uh, to achieve open access with uh, those articles, it's uh, either rights retention or secondary publishing right. Thank you, um, Vitaly. Uh, at Vilnius University, researchers they have like a full support of the administration. Uh, on different levels, both uh, faculty level and central administration. So they do not have to worry about that too much. If they want something, they just express their wishes and we are trying our best uh, to make them true. Okay, and uh, one additional question. Um, in this uh, telling to the publishers, uh, has the library any role? Um, First of all, I'd like to address this question to the four speakers and then to the people uh, participating in the webinar in case they know of some case. Dominic, uh, Gavin, Moika, Vitaly. So, the, so in terms of the, the, the notification of publishers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for, for us, um, we 
organized that activity in the library and it was library staff who compiled all the details into a, a, a spreadsheet actually <clears throat> we were quite lucky we we managed to get a, a list of notified publishers from from another source um, but then we had to kind of cross-reference um, things like postal details and contact details and stuff but then what we did was we asked legal services to send the letters um, because we it was a legal matter and we wanted it to have a kind of a whole university authority um, and also then any responses would go back to the legal team to deal with rather than the library and we basically it's like saying this is with our lawyers now you know speak to my lawyers okay thank you so you put the lawyers as, as the wall to this type of discussion thank you again um, yeah we we sent the letters out we basically did a lot of that admin and um, but it did go out under the name of the vice president for research so sort of very senior at the university we had run it past our legal team we've got quite a small legal team um, at king's so um yeah, they did give us a bit of a sense check. I think, as I said in the presentation, the letter was quite heavily based on one that the University of Cambridge had used that was particularly good. So, um, yeah, we're always happy to share those sorts of things. But um, it's, um, yeah, so we, we did it. And then we also dealt with anything coming back, which was which was very minor, actually. You know, I think we had a couple of questions, but no real pushback. I think by the time we did it, they got it from Edinburgh and they got it from maybe a couple of other people. So. Um, yeah, they were starting to think, okay, this is the way UK institutions are going. We'll just see what happens, I think. But... Okay, thank you. And uh, Vitaly and Mika, uh, in case um, you see yeah, this situation. I just wanted to say yeah. that um, um, it's quite natural to uh, involve library, libraries um, or their support uh, because they have long relationships with publishers. They know how publishers react, think, and so on. Uh, but uh, also, um, negotiations with publishers are immediately much, much more efficient if there is a rector sitting somewhere behind the Zoom or in a room, or if there is National Rector's Conference. Uh, and it's quite similar, as it was said before, that libraries could really help uh, in preparing the situation, the letters and everything. But it's much more efficient if there is a vice rector or rector or a legal department sending them. Okay, thank you. Well, I think no additional comment of, besides what was already said on, on, on the topic. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vitaly. Uh, so now let's uh, move to the next part of the webinar. Uh, Laura, can you please share the slides again? Of course. Okay, thank you. So we are now going to split all the participants in three groups. So Gavin will be facilitating uh, one of the groups uh, and we want that this group focuses on leadership and management. Uh, what's the role of different stakeholders at the university and of course, uh, the, the case of the library. Uh, the second group will be facilitated by Dominic Tate and um, uh, you will be discussing about uh, the funding issues and uh, how the funding agencies can influence these processes. And finally, there will be a third group uh, that will be facilitated by me, and we will try to share some experiences uh, from researchers. Um, hopefully, uh, we know of some cases. And these are the specific um, focuses of these three groups, but we can also uh, liaise these uh, topics with other similar or other interesting um, uh, discussions that we can raise, like um, the liaison between the libraries and research offices, um, um, the relationships with, between the publishers and researchers or the librarians, and this is something that we already discussed as an, a couple of minutes ago. And we can also discuss um, if these type of negotiations or let's say if statements from the universities can have an impact on other types of relationships. Uh, or is there a way to monitor if we are successful enough or not when implementing this type of uh, policies or strategies? And finally, uh, we also want that people uh, express their needs. Um, what are your needs in your institution? Do you feel alone or not? Do you, you, do you feel there's some room for uh, discussing and, and raising this topic? Um, if you remember in the poll that we made for all the participants, uh, most of the of the answers were 
I'm not sure if the university is taking care of that. So I think maybe that's the first step, getting to know if our um, um, managers, if our leaders have already thought about this topic and they are already cooking something on the university. So what we expect from you, we expect some free, productive, uh, enriching discussion of these topics. And we also ask you to um, choose some volunteers, at least one person in each group. And the facilitators will not be the speakers, so please be uh, as proactive as possible. And uh, finally, we want that you all promote support or even implement uh, right retention strategies at your institution. So uh, let's um, let's uh, create the work, the record rooms, and uh, you will be directed in. Yes, we are opening the breakout room, so uh, just in a few seconds you should be redirected to your room in a very anti-democratic way. We assign, we pre-assigned you because I mean there was a great, there were some pretty in the sense we tried to have some geographical balance and also not to have people from the same university, but of course. No, I mean, not all the people who register uh, attended the webinar or some have to be before. So if there are any issues, you can still go back to the main room and we will be there to, to monitor. But now we are opening the three breakout rooms. See you. Uh, uh, so we have like uh, 30 minutes. So um, at 3.30, we will be back for the reporting to the, for the, to the plenary. Thank you, Laura. We will start with uh, Gavin's group on uh, leadership management. Um, Gavin, did you manage to get some volunteers or not? Well, we had a few, um, I think we had a few issues with the breakout room getting set up and then we also seem to have audio issues. I'm not sure that everyone in our group could even hear us. So it was unfortunately quite a limited discussion. There were only a couple of us could take part. But, yeah, um, because many people left the webinar before going to the breakout room. So, so. yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we even we yeah. had people in our breakout room who didn't seem able to hear us. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. But anyway, um, so yes, I didn't actually manage to get a uh, <laughs> someone to report back. But we. I can say a few words. It won't take thank you, thank you, it, it won't take five minutes. So I think we we talked about sort of different legislative contexts and how that can make a big difference. But um, but obviously we also um, had heard earlier in that seminar from uh, um, about actually how you know national legislation can you know push this through in quite a big way. Um, and we talked about just the importance of sort of stressing the benefits to researchers and things like that in order to align our um, sort of university leadership and get things behind um, and actually talking about how things could actually be protective of researchers, I think, seemed to be, you know, quite important. Um, and and really what the national context was. So, you know, we had different examples of different countries where there had been quite a big national context, quite a big move towards this with lots of institutions. And um, and then really how some institutions are quite heavily legislated um, and controlled more centrally from government and some are very much more independent. And it, it, so it really sort of just varies. So we ended up talking quite a bit about that. But unless okay. anyone anyone else in the group wants to chip, wants to add, I think that's probably all from me. Yeah, if anybody wants to add something, that's uh, the moment. Uh, or otherwise, we can move to the second group. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Dominic, anybody is going to report or I it's do, you? I don't mind. I don't mind doing. It. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, but I, I would suggest that others chip in if there's anything I I miss. So. Um, Again, a small group, small but perfectly formed. Um, so we discussed, um, we talked a little bit about national context to start with and how, you know, um, with anything to do with this, kind of it has to work within your own legal framework. And, and so understanding your national context, understanding what what is going to work, what cannot work um, from, from the outset is, um, is, is going to be kind of key to, to make any changes here. Um, we had um we then we were supposed to talk about funding so we we kind of talked about um a little bit about um policy and how policies that are related to funder requirements 
sometimes easier for authors to follow or, or authors feel more inclined to, to follow policies when they're directly related to, to current or future funding opportunities. There's a bit of a, sort of a kick in the backside for, for authors to want to play a bit of a role there. Um, so we talked about that. Um, and then we talked about um, funding for open access as well. And in particular, we shared experiences about how we have set up different or we're looking at setting up different um, different funds to, to, to manage payments for, uh, for open access opportunities and to what extent they might be paid for by the library or the university or not at all and only by, by the funder. And we, we kind of shared some experiences around that. Um, happy to, to just open it up to, to others. Um, Mari, Shibute, um, Vitaly, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Thank you, Dominique. Anybody wants to add anything? No? Okay, great. Uh, so it's now um, group three uh, on researchers' experiences. And uh, it, it was great because there were actually two researchers in the group. We were four people, two researchers, so it's, it's great. I don't know how you did that, Laura, but it, it, it was perfect for us. Um, and we were uh, four people, two uh, one person uh, librarian working at the library, uh, two researchers, and another person uh, with a legal um, um, background uh, working uh, in, in the library in close relationships, but with not no librarian background. So it was great because we have we had a diversity of perspective on on these um, uh, situations that researchers need to face with uh, their institutions and with the publishers. So um, to summarize a little bit what we discussed, um, for instance, the, the researchers uh, that participated in the group were young researchers. So they are learning how this is actually going on because, for instance, uh, one of them is a PhD researcher, but she has not yet published anything. Uh, and she expects to publish uh, the, her uh, doctoral thesis as a book in the next few years. So she will need to understand uh, the landscape of rights retention. So um, uh, she has no prior knowledge, but she is really interested in that. And the other researcher is a very interesting case. And I think this is a quite common case where a young researcher works in a research group with senior uh, researchers and they prepare some papers. Uh, the senior researcher takes care of everything and some people don't sign anything. So they don't actually know what are their rights. They don't know what they can do with their papers. They don't know if they can upload their papers into an institutional repository. And I think this is uh, something really uh, to make us think about. And um, one of the things that both um, highlight is that they know that their universities and also the libraries uh, organize uh, seminars, they organize training, they also have some people to, that can help researchers but um, somehow they think that uh, researchers may feel alone because they are not really, um, uh, they don't feel the, the, the weight of the institution behind, so to say. And um, uh, the, the, the other perspective from the uh, legal point of view within the library organization is really interesting because uh, this, uh, this colleague uh, was explaining that she, is working with the library in legal um, uh, in legal issues uh, because the university uh, has an open science center with funding from the European uh, Union. And this is great because otherwise the library wouldn't have any legal profile. And um, when she explained that, I explained the situation in Spain. Uh, um, we have the Spanish national uh, network of university libraries. We have a, a working group on intellectual property. And only a few people are actually uh, librarians with legal background, which is a problem because once they are retiring or once they are going out of our universities, we are losing a lot of knowledge. And for instance, one of my colleagues um, who works at the library, uh, she studied law uh, and uh, she's retiring th this year very soon. So uh, what are we going to do in the, in the next years? We need to train the new librarians 
to, to become legal librarians, but they don't have legal background. And this is a problem because if you can recruit librarians with this profile, that's great. But for instance, in Spain, uh, we are civil servants and we have some exams and some procedures and um, you, don't, you cannot um, for, foresee who's coming to your institution. So we have here a, a problem when guiding researchers and sometimes we need to go back to the legal offices of the university and they don't usually are experts in intellectual property rights. So I think we need to have this um, deep reflection on how to improve the type of uh, support that we can we can provide, and also this um, this colleague from the uh, other university uh, working with the library, uh, she said that um, uh, for the time being they have not had any uh, problems with publishers or with researchers, and in one case that uh, one researcher had some problems with one of the publishers, uh, they contacted the publisher and they changed the license and everything was okay. So that's that's great. Uh, but of course this was an article. And they are aware that if this uh, uh, was the case with the book, maybe uh, the situation would be totally different. And um, and I think this this is the um, the picture of what we discussed. Um, so I don't know if uh, Sonia or Francesco or Anna, you want to add anything? No. Uh, okay. I think you covered yeah. everything. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, any participant wants to ask anything or wants to contribute with a reflection or uh, anything that may be useful for us all? No. Uh, okay. So let's um, let's close the the webinar. We are closing this a uh, little bit earlier than expected, but I think the discussion was uh, very much productive. And I think uh, what Dominique, uh, Gavin, uh, Moika, and uh, Vitali presented was uh, really uh, interesting for um, uh, for many of us who has have not yet implemented. Uh, this type of strategies in, in, in our institutions to push us a little bit to try to inquire if uh, this is on the agenda of our managers or not, or if we already know if this is in our agenda to try to push a little bit. Uh, I think um, there's life beyond uh, the, the United States or the United Kingdom. Uh, Johan shared uh, this page with a list of um, the university with right retention policies, and that's great. This is really inspiring, but uh, when we see <laughs> The list in detail, um, only a few, uh, really a few institutions come from other countries uh, like Germany or Saudi Arabia or um, even one from Spain or Norway. So I think this is um, re really a reason for us all to try to work intensively in right retention and to try to make our researchers more aware of their rights and to try to push institutional strategies because we cannot expect from researchers to fight individually one-to-one -one with publishers. So I hope this uh, webinar um, is also a source of inspiration for us. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you again, uh, Gavin and Dominic and um, uh, Vitali and, and Moika for your experiences. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, Johan, for commenting and providing us this really uh, important information for us. And thank you, Laura and Thibault, for organizing the, the webinar, as always, from the Unica uh, office. And see you in the next uh, webinar. And we hope this will be uploaded soon uh, so that anybody can, can go back to the recording and to the presentations. So see you soon and take care. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much to everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>